As my uh, esteemed panel is hopefully turning on mics and videos here, um, thank you for the, the kickoff, Sam and Michelle, this morning. Uh, my name is Krista Heibel. I am the CEO, founder, and president of SCH Consulting Group. So I work within the broader customer experience contact center space for uh, over 25 years now. I stopped adding after that. And uh, I'm very excited to be here today to kind of kick us off with this topic. I actually love some of the titles of some of these sessions. Um, save, what did Michelle just say? They save time and money, or I don't remember what that one was called tomorrow. But today we're going to talk about the compliance is from Mars and sales is from Venus, which kind of made me giggle. Uh, I think this is a... Looks like we're dropping. Yes. The difficulties of the virtual world. We're looking. I don't know if this is my connection here. Sorry about that. Uh, we're looking today. Can you guys hear me okay? We can. Okay. Yeah, oh, my back. goodness. I'm so sorry. So I'm going to tour guys for this panel, and if I just disappear, the panel will take care of themselves. Let's put it that way. So we're here today to talk about the challenges between compliance and... <laughs> I feel like she did that almost as a setup to say, I'm going to drop now, and I'm going to throw you guys out there. And you'll do the best you possibly can. Exactly. She's back. We'll give her one more shot and then we'll take over, right, Jay? I think that's probably the way to get it. She's, she's frozen because <laughs> she's getting ready to ask me a question, I think. Yeah. Let's pretend she does ask me that question. <laughs> well, I guess we could do intros while we wait for her, her to come back on. <laughs> So I think what Krista was, Krista was leading up to, we, we basically, we put together this group of people who are all dealing with different compliance and sales facets and wanted to get some different opinions on where things are and, and what compliance means in sales. And I think Krista was going to throw the first question to me, which I believe was, what does the market want today and, and what sales challenges are we seeing in the market today? And that's a huge question, and I'm, I feel kind of silly to be the first person to answer that since I'm surrounded by people who have tremendously more experience. But I'll, I'll say this. Um, the market today wants ease of communication, and they want it to be as quick and as cheap as it can possibly be. Yeah. They want as few touch points as possible, and they want to be able to follow a customer journey that the customer can dictate. So if the customer wants to reach out to you by via text message, they want to talk to a human being or they don't ever want to talk to a human being. The market today wants to build programs and projects of, for communication that, that enable that customer journey. And right. they want to do it in every way they possibly can. And, and so from a compliance perspective, that really starts with express written consent. You need to get express written consent as soon as you start down the funnel of engagement with a customer so that you have those open communication options. Because if you're waiting to design a program that, that doesn't involve express written consent, now you've got to do it on every single channel, every single time they engage you on one of those specific channels. And I feel like what, what I've seen, particularly in the past couple of years, is that Really successful engagement programs have relied upon sort of determining what the objective was, what, what do we really want to get to. Um, and if somebody says this is not going to work from a compliance perspective, the answer is, I, I, I get that. that it, it might not, but let's, what are we trying to 
accomplish. Now, what can we do to get there? Going back to the opening quote, you have to look at what's coming next and you have to try to figure out ways around it. And, and by saying around it, I don't mean to, to violate compliance at all, but rather to engage compliance to ensure a successful and happy customer. And I, what, do you, what, do you, what would you add to that, Andy? Uh, I think you hit some of the the same things I was going to say, but you're you're right. I mean, the market right now is looking for big and fast campaigns, scalable campaigns that are quick to adapt and quick to pivot, right? I mean, I think the last 12, 14 months now has shown us a lot of good things um, you know, in response to COVID, right? I mean, uh, it, it shows the industry can adapt. It, it shows the industry can pivot uh, when needed. Um, and unfortunately, this was a, a situation that was un unavoidable, right? Um, the, the virus hit, different companies had to do a lot of different things, but now it's really built a good foundation, at least in my opinion, for us to make those types of change quick, quickly and make sure they're done in a compliant manner. Uh, I mean, I can think of a lot of different things that, that we did you know, over the last you know twelve months, uh, that's that's new and, and that's in innovative, and, and things that we can continue to do that's going to help our clients and, and pivot quickly. But I mean, you think think of like different industries that had an impact to COVID and, and how they had to change their business strategy and how they had to launch new services and get in contact with uh, you know their consumers. Or even, you know, relaunching an existing business line with, you know, requirements that were adjusted because of the the, the, the virus or, or other, you know, downstream effects. So I think that's a big part of it is making sure that we can offer those quick type of uh, campaigns, you know, the responses, managing consumer consent, like you were talking through, Jay. I think that's a, a huge point that I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about later. I think the other thing is too is with that ability to quickly adapt and quickly change uh, in a sales environment, you know, comes the, the technology aspect of it and the digitization of of our industry. Um, and that's been the case for the last three or four years. I mean, and for some who have been more innovative, you know, it's been even longer. But I mean, with with now the, the the contact channels that we have, and, and not just omnichannel, right? You know, beyond omnichannel, uh, and just using technology with artificial intelligence and things like that. Um, and I, and I know that might feel uh, uncomfortable to to a few of you compliance people like myself, right? But I mean, part of that is getting through that change, making sure the consumers do do have control of a process that is frictionless for them. Uh, they control how they're contacted, how they are, and how often they're contacted, which you know we'll get to as well. But really making sure that that their interests, their preferences are considered, are accounted for. Uh, and, and again, it, it's it's something that can adapt and can be changed quickly. Right. I just want to add one little piece in there as well. I and mean, we talked about the value, and I I think we'd be remiss to think that. At the end of this, that is going to go away. I think that so many customers and companies at this point, um, it's the value added aspect of it. And it's not going to change after the end of the pandemic. We have to look at additional ways to save the cost. And a lot of that is through the technology, as you stated, eliminating all the repeatable redundant tasks, um, anything that can can be done through maybe self service portals, um, you, uh, smart IVRs. We got a lot to talk about, but keeping that value for our customers um, is going to be pivotal for from here on out, I believe. Yeah, I agree. I think we saw we saw so many clients that had call volume spikes during the middle of the pandemic, and so we instituted a number of different technologies, each of which required consent from the customer to participate in. So in the middle of 180% call arrival the forecast, we're going to introduce a new variable to this customer base and say, by the way, because it's because you're we're being inundated with calls, we're going to institute new technology for you to talk with us, whether that be messaging or a call back or switching you over to email. But we need 
to get your consent before we do that. And all those types of things that happened in the middle or at the very beginning of the pandemic, to Laura's point, they're only going to continue. We're just going to see those become for everybody. Right. And I think that, I'm sorry, Harvey. No, no, go ahead. I'm coming after you. No, I just, I just think that, that um, right now, I think you're going to also go through contract renewal time is ca- coming up and you're going to see some renegotiations that are happening because the cost saving efforts um, will continue. Um, I know during this time period, everyone is looking for the value, whether it be the actual member or if the client that's serving the members, we did have massive call spikes that happened, um, but in many cases, it was it was because members were closing their accounts, right? A um, lot of revenue was lost um, over this past 12, 15 months of the pandemic, and uh, our, our companies are going to look to recoup those losses. So we've got to improve our sales to see how we can keep those and, and keep that loyalty with our, with our groups. But um, lots of changes are happening at this point. Yeah, Jay, I want to go back to uh, what your original question was about what does the market want. And and I want to just say very simply, and I don't mean this in any disrespectful way, but I often, you know, tell my team that we were all toddlers at one point. And when we were toddlers, we often want what we want, how we want it, and when we want it. And I really see that is how we have to serve our customers, right? And and those firms that can do that, that for them are the firms that they'll choose to do business with and those firms that don't kind of fall to the way side. Again, no disrespectful way, but all of us know we have to be customer centric. Uh, you know, meaning, you know, many of us as we were taught in the business and, and early on, sometimes we were product centric and then you pushed it out to a customer by making repetitive calls. We all know the customer has to be the middle of that particular journey and everything has to be built from your marketing to your sales strategy to all your technology strategy. All of it has to be focused around what is best for the customer. And I would just say, if I picked a few words to say, what does the market want today? Obviously, customers want convenience. Customers want speed. They want personalization. They also want consistency of performance. And no no plug for my industry since I'm in the telecom industry, but I also would say it has to be digitized or wireless enabled because, again, they want to be able to access you whenever and however they choose. And that's, I think, one of the things that we learned through this last pandemic, as many of you noted. I often say, you know, I work in the telecom industry, so we always work with customers on two key things, connectivity and also about disaster recovery. But I have never in all my 30 plus years seen an event that was an unbounded disaster. Meaning, you know, if you have a hurricane, you know it's a time bound and it's geographically bound. And, you know, so most disasters have a boundaries to it that we can plan for and recover from very quickly. This one was geographically unbounded. Time, unbounded. I mean, just Every element was unbounded. And so those businesses that were still more ready or more prepared from a disaster recovery were able to make those those quicker changes. And frankly, all of us had to do that, given what this panel is about. We had to do that in a way that served that customer, that, that customer-centric, but do it in a way that was compliant, right? So we had, in my case, we had to move people from the offices to their homes but you still have to do that in a way that you're protecting customer information. You're protecting our databases. You're not leaving yourself vulnerable to those hackers who are out there and saw this as a great opportunity as well. So, it, you know, the, 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 the reality is you never, never can separate both your need for customer service, your need for productivity or revenue, as well as the requirements both within your company and within laws and regulations for compliance. Clients. And this made all of those came, things come to a forefront, and we all had to move very quickly. Very quickly. That was very well said, Harvey. Very well said. I think 
the, the next question that, uh, that Krista had set up for us, what are some main or what are some compliance main pitfalls? Or why don't you set us off on that one? Compliance main pitfalls for me would just be if the compliance component's just not part of the sales process. When it's added more of a bolt-on as opposed to being part of the complete process, you never want it to be um, a drag on, on the business per se. Um, so wherever we have the ability to, like we talked about a little bit earlier, to add and see, I apologize. See, that's virtual issues, right? Other phones are ringing in the lines. I apologize. Um, when we we talked about a little earlier, trying to create other opportunities or other methods um, using maybe IVRs to be able to do some of the automated pieces and some of the self-serve pieces where you have the ability to build the compliance um, models in um, so that it's just seamless. You don't want the customer um, with any extended period of times on the phones with maybe a representative that's helping them. Um, we just want it to be as seamless as possible. Just not to drag the business down or to elongate that entire sales process. At least for us, that's what we're finding um, makes it much easier. What about you, Andy? What are you guys seeing? Yeah, I mean, it's just amazing manage compliance, I fall into a lot of these pitfalls myself, right? And that's how you learn from your past. And and I've been in compliance, I've managed compliance for, you know, a while now. Uh, and I think there's there's things you have to realize uh, as a compliance professional or even as a sales professional or whatever the case is. We all have our preconceptions. We have our perceptions and perceptives perspectives of, of just you know operations and just different things that we do and we all have our tr trigger words and we have to be cognizant of our trigger words and overreacting to changes or new ideas right right um, yeah. you know, with, with covid and with other things and, and just the the divisive you know atmosphere that this country is is it finds itself in now uh th there's different Different ways of, of just responding to trigger words, and when it comes to compliance, you know, obviously, you know, with being risk adverse or different levels of tolerance to risk, you have to be aware of those trigger words and, and making sure that you respond to them. Uh, you, you don't get caught off guard, especially with your clients as well. Uh, you need to really understand what their desires are. Uh, make sure that they understand what's going going on and really uh, you know, make sure that you account for their fears and, and their response to trigger words as well. Uh, and, that, and, and some of that's also overacting. Uh, I think in the past, and, and I would say this for all compliance people on this uh, presentation, is you know, we've all been guilty of overreacting, right? You, you know, based on those trigger words or whether it's you know, a, a type of sale where whether it's a type of program or just a new industry, for example, overreacting to new changes or to new ideas can definitely put people on edge, defensive, uh, and, and it really is going to elongate and really acerbate the, the problem, exacerbate the problem. Uh, we want to make sure that, that we're comfortable discussing them, make sure we do the due diligence and not just shut down conversations, make sure that, you know, that the, we get – we had a, we set a, a process up. We established that process, and we were consistent with that process. Um, and, and don't get set in your ways. I mean, it, it's you know, I think in compliance and, and, and operations, sometimes it's it's been that way uh, for forever, or we've done it this way, or we're not open to new ways. But with today's environment, and you know, like I said, the explosion of new industries, uh, responsive you know, responsiveness to new technology. We have to make sure that we are an agent of change or change agent, really. Uh, making sure that we're exploring new ways of doing things, not just set in our ways, but exploring new, th new things. Make sure that we do it in a compliant manner, like, like Harvey just mentioned, uh, and really having that foundation of due diligence. Uh, you know, making sure, and that's where compliance really comes in, right? You know, making sure everybody has 
has that same compliance mindset, but also making sure that we explore the, the opportunities you know, in new industries or new technologies, making sure that we understand the risk and controls, uh, you know, for that for that new service or for that new industry, making sure that we uh, it makes sense from a business perspective. Once you account for all the risk, all the controls, and uh, things that we we can do to mitigate that risk, and then make that informed decision. And sometimes, you know, that's been done by compliance in the past or done by operations in the past, and it's not a collaborative effort. Obviously, you got to get the buy-in from the key stakeholders, uh, you know, identify the risk and the controls, and then ultimately, you know, let the business and, and you know, a, a collaboration of teams, you know, make that decision. Um, and, and not having that, that foundational process of due diligence is really where a, a pitfall could be. Or a big pitfall, uh, and, and just being set in your ways and not open to new ideas. So it, it's good to, you know, have that collaborative, you know, environment, making sure that you account for risk because risks are out there. Risks are going to exist. There's not a risk-free environment that we operate in. Uh, right. I wish there was. Right, my job would be a whole lot easier, but that's just not the case. And as these things evolve, and as the regulatory environment changes. Uh, you know, it's our it's our job and really our deliverable to our clients and to our, their consumers to make sure that we have their best interests at need and we are doing the best thing from a consumer perspective in a compliant manner. You know, Andy, uh, you know, that's, that's great insight there. You know, you talk about risk and I know when I think about compliance as a sales leader, you know, obviously first and foremost, the first thing I think about the pitfalls or the risk of that is that I put myself and my team at risk if we don't comply with our company's uh, guidelines and, and our company's codes of business conduct. And, right. you know, in addition, obviously, I then run the risk of violating whether it be regulations or laws at the local, state, or federal level. And, and we don't want to do that because it brings potential exposure not only to ourselves, to our business, both legally and financially. So clearly, that's not where you want to be. The, the other part I'd say when it comes to compliance is, is I always have the saying that, that I took from somewhere that, you know, you must be present to win. And so when you operate outside of the compliance standards, you run the real risk of you, yourself, as well as your firm not being around or being present anymore. So how do you win if you're not in the game, right? So I think you have to look at it from there, but we have, we have to go beyond that. And one of the reasons I work with Pace and encourage other people to work with Pace is because quite candidly, this is a chance and opportunity Pace provides to people to be aware of all the compliance pitfalls and all the upcoming regulation, but more importantly that to help shape it to help have dialogue with those people that make the decisions so that in the game that you're going to have to play in, you actually can help shape the rules that govern. Uh, and you can also help do some self-regulation because let's be candid. I think all of us would, if, if we have to do something, would prefer to do it in the way that we think is best, right? We all shape a little bit when we're told you must do it this way, this way, this way, very specific. So PACE gives us the opportunity to help shape the industry and to help shape the rules by how this industry is governed. And that whole self-regulation piece and self-determination is something I think all human beings can value. The other thing I would say is a risk, quite candidly, working with from the sales side is I always talk about any place I see success or any place I see failure, there's always three A's that are present, right? Attitude, ability, and action. And attitude is just our mindset. And, and so your whole, whole mindset about compliance sets the foundation for whether we're going to have a successful both compliant and, uh, compliance and a, a sales program. And then obviously you have to build the right ability, using the right tools, et cetera. And then action is the whole level of execution so that you can do it. So you'll miss, if you don't have the right mindset, you miss all the opportunities that compliance provides to us to both sell and to improve our productivity. And I'll just give, you know, one, you know, quick example is, 
you know, because I work with third party contact centers that that support our business, I get to see some that are unbelievably uh, advanced in terms of all the technology that they use. And then I see some that look not much different than when I, I was dialing. I mean, you look at things around the cubicle <laughs> and it's, <laughs> it's still kind of like, man, I go back and say, is this 1980 or whatnot? But, but at the end of the day, if you have a firm for instance, that will invest in speech analytics. And they invested in it because they wanted to ensure that mandatory or required disclosures were being done. So that's why they really, so that's from a compliance standpoint, why they invested in that software. But I think all of us recognize from a sales standpoint, you can take that same program and obviously do some phenomenal things to lift your productivity using something that a firm might have invested in strictly from a compliance standpoint and to, and to learn the difference between whether customers said yes to a mandatory disclosure that they understood it versus said yes to the sale. And then obviously we get into the insights of why did they say yes? And then I can leverage that across the entire channel that I'm responsible for. And that's where you get the real productivity list that can happen. So my point is, if you have the right mindset, when we talk about the main pitfalls of compliance, you turn those into growth opportunities, um, which is what every firm uh, uh, needs and everybody wants to be successful. You have to be a part of that, whether you're on the legal side, the compliance side, or the sales side, That's we all have thing. to do customer service and generate revenue. What's well, the same thing? You know, we all have to do sales. I mean, the if the ultimate of sales is that you are able to, to have the cleanest communication, right? So mm -hmm. if compliance has the ability to sell, the sales team, sales team has the ability to sell the customer. So yeah. we're all we're all in that same boat. It's all still a form of sales. I completely agree. I think Annie made the point about team of teams, and I I, <clears throat> I feel like the main compliance pitfall is not involving compliance from the very beginning. If you don't get, it, it's, it's part of the sales process. It's part of the engagement process, whether you like it or you don't like it. And if you don't involve compliance from the very beginning, you're likely to get down to the end. And as you, as you referenced earlier, you're going to end up with a bolt on Laura. Yep. And those never, and they never work out the way you want them to. So you really have to plan for compliance as you're going through. I love the point. If you can, if you can sell, you can comply. And if you can comply, you can sell. It's the same thing. Um, Harvey, why don't you take this next question for us, which was, what has the uh, sales operations side learned is key in doing successful compliance programs? I did read that. <laughs> No, no, I appreciate the question. You know, from my perspective, again, I try to, you know, I, I tell people, I try to make the complex simple, but some people tell me I take the simple and make it complex. But, <laughs> but to me, when I look at the, what we learn in having successful compliance programs, I look at it very much like having a successful relationship anywhere, you know, with a spouse, a partner, a, a child, a friend, etc. So, all of those things that help us have that kind of relationship um, are important in having uh, the, the successful compliance program, meaning most relationships that are very, very successful start with an element of trust, right? And one of my favorite books by Covey is The Speed of Trust. And he trust. talks about when you have that kind of speed, how fast you can can move as a business. And when you don't have it, you pay a trust tax because everything slows up. So I think yes. clearly when you're working with your compliance team, you need to establish trust, you need to establish communication, and you need to establish transparency and obviously collaboration. And it's it's frankly about finding the common ground and finding those common goals. And, you know, I, I, I often use humor to, to help build uh, relationships and to build the trust and to, and to deepen those. And I know when I get a new compliance person, uh, most recently we had one at the beginning of last year. And so I said, hey, look, look, 
as we work with each other, I'm going to propose a lot of new ideas that we can take to the market. And, and what I would like is if you promise not to be Dr. No, right? Like everything I propose, <laughs> no, 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 no. Then, then, then I promise not to be Dr. Go, meaning no matter what compliance says. I tell my team, let's do it anyways, right? So, um, so you know, but I, I try to do that as a way of, of establishing, not, not the humor, the establish the fact that I want us to have this transparent, open, honest, uh, communicative relationship. And I think that becomes real important for them to be able to do that. Because ultimately, no matter what I'm doing and what I ask my team to do, we're using the Venn diagram. Right, which is basically we say, what is good for the end user customer? So we always start there. And then I'll, I go to what is good for our company. And because we partner with third party call centers, what is good for that partner? And if that diagram is not in balance, it's not a sustainable program. That's a great right. point. Excellent point. Lauren, what would you add? Anything? Anything that you would add to that? Well, I think he, I think that he articulated that very well. It's, it's, it's right Definitely. on, right oh, on target. Right, very difficult to follow tough, up. It's tough to follow up, Doctor <laughs> No, Doctor Go. I mean, that's, that's exactly what it comes down to, Harvey. You're absolutely right, and that again, it's a repetitive theme. But if you don't, don't get compliance involved from the beginning, you don't have like, a team of teams. You're not going to end up anywhere you want to. We're going to throw this next question to you, Andy, and that is how do we design successful programs and eliminate the myths that it can't be done? Yeah. Um, it, ironically enough, it's, it's a lot of what Harvey was just describing. Uh, I, I think, you know, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit from that last question, too, and then go, go through it as well. I mean, obviously... The, the earlier you bring compliance into the equation, it, it's the best for, for all parties. And, and to have and foster that collaborative type of environment where you truly understand what the client's needs are, what their, what their perceived pitfalls could be, what their failures, what their goals are, how things have been done in the past, and really understanding exactly what they're looking for at the end of the day. And then we're talking through it with, with compliance with all the different areas of support because compliance is a part of that, legal is a part of that, right? Uh, and getting, you know, even IT and, and the technology aspects of it, you know, involved as well. I mean, that cross-functional team should really be uh, an all-encompassing or comprehensive team, right? It shouldn't just be focused on compliance or, or legal or, or operations in the other direction because like Harvey said you know we want to be the go team we don't want to be the business prevention unit as you know as others would describe it right we want to empower enable operations uh, to to have growth with the clients and, and ultimately make the a great opportunity and, and solution for the for the client so that that it Involves getting with, you know, early with compliance, of course, uh, walking through the process, you know, with the new client. Uh, you know, one of the things I think is important too, and then you know, we've been doing a lot more is just having me and my group as sales consultants getting on calls with clients, walking them through the process, making sure that they feel comfortable with not only how we're doing it. Uh, uh, and, and launching, but also how we're managing and looking at it from a controls and monitoring perspective post-launch. Uh, and that's important for operations to stay engaged with with, with compliance uh, as well as the clients even after the fact. So, you know, I, I've launched you know, my team from a compliance and, and regulatory affairs perspective to really be sales consultants, get to know your clients or, or our clients and make sure they understand what your role, what you're responsible for and give them that comfort level that we are looking out for the best interest, not only for their company, but for the consumers and their customers as well. Cause I think that's key. I mean, it's different. Uh, and I want to make sure that, you know, my team is ingratiated and ingrained with uh, the clients. And so they understand what's going on. Um, 
but uh, again, I think sometimes it goes back to, you know, just making sure that, you know, we stay engaged uh, across those three different units. And, and like I said, even the other support areas within the company, uh, you know, making sure that we, we understand the client's requirements, their needs, their desires. Uh, and that can, that can change too. That's another important reason for us to make sure that we stay engaged and continue that dialogue uh, and, and have that partnership with ops, uh, making sure that we have the right level of due diligence. Of course, the compliance guy is going to say due diligence numerous times to this presentation, of course. But it's, it's, it's important, right? And so you want to make sure that you cover all the requirements requirements from the client's perspective, the, all the regulatory and, and uh, legal requirements as well, uh, uh, and just making sure that, you know, at the time of launch, everything's been accounted for, you've gone through your, your compliance due diligence, you know, from an operations perspective, everything is what it seems to be, where it should be. You monitor and control at launch, post-launch, you know, share best practices. Um, and then, you know, again, don't let – it's not a set and forget it, right? We're not uh, selling rotisseries here. We're, we're selling a product or service that needs to be monitored and enhanced, right? Um, and, and just because the lights are on in the house doesn't mean all the other appliances are working as designed. And so that's the piece that, you know, that successful program, it needs to be – successful throughout the, the journey of the life cycle, uh, you know, with the client and ultimately the consumer, making sure that it's functioning as designed, it's in a, it's functioning in a compliant manner, uh, and it's even improving and enhance, being enhanced over time. I think that's key. Laura, that's, that's, I feel like this is right up your alley because I know you're, because of what you're dealing with and it's so compliant or um, compliance oriented. Anything to add on that specifically? No, I mean, he's, it's touching on every component of it. I think that the only adding into some sometimes you bring into the marketing department as well, so you can help pretty it up a little bit to try to maybe make it a little bit more more succinct. Um, I know that with us being in both the healthcare space, it's we are very compliant driven driven organization. Um, I know that we touched on it earlier that if we if we don't do it properly, you're actually putting the company in total risk. You can lose your entire business because you didn't do it appropriately. Um, right. 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 So it's I like I like Harvey. Doctor go, doctor no, right? We want to we want to make sure that we're staying on that same boat. But it's a total team effort all the way across the board. Yeah. I'm going to jump back to something Andy mentioned earlier, and that the due diligence is really critical. But I feel like the audit process is just as vital. Being able to have the systems in place that demonstrate compliance, that can prove compliance. And so, I mean, all, all, you, you can... It doesn't take a whole lot to invest in a system that can in, that can ensure compliance all the way down to the rep level. For example, in, at, our, at our company, uh, compliance is connected to the phone switch. So if you're not supposed to be making or taking a certain kind of call, you're simply not going yeah. to be able to. It's just not going to happen. Um, and, and because of that, we have to be able to audit all of those systems on a routine basis. We have to make sure that everything is going right. And we have to be able to test our compliance on I, I, our, uh, our, I know that our IT, our IT department spends more time in compliance audits than they do just about anything else, because that's, you have to prove on an ongoing basis that you're doing everything the way you should. We had an interesting question. Jay, if I could just say that, you know, it's so, it's so important to do those audits. And I know at our firm, the, the audits we do within our contact centers, you know, they call them do-right audits, right? And at first I thought it was like the name of the person who created it. I didn't realize <laughs> what the essence of it really means is just do right, right? Like do the right thing. And, and 
and you get there. And a lot of that really does start with the mindset or attitude that I, I talked about uh, earlier. And I continue to tell people, like, even when it comes to audits, our sales teams, I always say to them, hey, if you're going to go to the party anyways, you might as well help select the music that you're going to end up dancing to. And so if you go to the thing dreading to have a, uh, a dread and go to the party, then you're going to have a terrible time. So I think audits, you know, obviously are really a critical component of of your uh, compliance program and, and a good partnership, a good foundation for the partnership between sales and your staff. Yeah, and real quick, Jay, and I think that's good, Harvey, because obviously do the right thing. I mean, should be a mantra that you and everybody in the company uh, and at the clients and, and everyone else embraces. Right. I mean, we've done a lot with, you know, integrity, uh, integrity in action, making sure that every decision that we make and building that culture of compliance is the same across my group from a compliance and risk perspective, but also with operations. And if you embed that culture across everybody in the company and consistently communicate expectations around integrity and doing the right thing, then it becomes second nature to them. And that's how they should operate. And uh, when you have that mindset and then you start having these discussions as a cross, you know, you know, functional team, then it makes makes my job a lot easier because everybody's already viewing new new programs or new opportunities with that compliance lens and, and i think that that's key especially in this day and age uh to continue to to encourage uh you know people and, and employees and, and making sure that that communication stays consistent because i mean that, that that type of audit with you know with you guys i mean do right i mean it just says it straight out and it sets the expectation and it's just a really good reinforcement. And I think if you build that foundation of culture of compliance, you know, within a company, you know, those types of things, uh, you know, like like I said, become second nature, and everybody becomes a compliance analyst. But that's when you have the technology that it's got to be in place. There are so many programs that you can set up, and if you don't have the appropriate technology, uh, you don't really know what's happening on that front line level, right? Uh, uh, voice analytics is, so speech analytics is huge in being able to ensure that you're compliant and driven, and that even that you're doing the sales piece, that you're making the X amount of attempts, and that you're using the right um, uh, right sales techniques that we're, that we've, you know, that we teach. There's so much that we preach every day within that environment and um, it still doesn't come through in, in the end on that line. And uh, without that technology in the background to verify, my, my line is always trust but verify, right? Yeah, so. um, <laughs> exactly. Until you can verify in the end, you really don't know what's happening. I, I know that within our environment, we were uh, listening to uh, you know, 10 to 15 calls on a representative type level. And that's just a drop in a bucket, you know. But once we got the technology in place with the uh, speech analytics and you're getting 100% of your calls that are being reviewed, uh, the things that you find out are... Uh, Sometimes can make you cringe, right? They can make you cringe. So it gives you an opportunity to get it corrected before it gets any worse. Acceptance is the first step to moving on, right? You see, yeah. you see, you see data, and what is it? What the old maxim is: the worst thing you can do with data is nothing. Yeah. So you have access to that information. It allows you to step up your compliance game, and that's good. I feel like that's a great segue to you, Laura, for this question that I'm going to pull off the side. Since we're doing this virtually, there's this great little technology of questions and answers on the side. And uh, Michael Fitrell asked, in vocally supporting the necessity of compliance to partnering call centers, how would you respond to those who think 
overcompliance heavily reduces their sales ability. And I feel like there's a couple of key words in that question, but I'm really interested in your perspective. Uh, Overly compliant? That's the, that's the word that kicks out to me is overly compliant. I don't know the you can actually really be overly compliant. Um, I, I, I think that's, I see that maybe as a more of a sales opportunity for the compliance team to be able to um, uh, get further in sync with, with the compliance team. Um, I, I, again, I don't believe there's any such thing as being overly compliant. Um, in, in our current business, something as simple as as the representative or or the sales person um, in in a Medicare space not um, selling something that the rep, that the that the member didn't want. I mean, you, again, you you have the ability to have yourself sued. You can shut your business down. Um, I get. I have I have difficulty with with that one as far as being overly compliant. Well, you know, Lori, if I, if I could just comment on this, Jay, and I and I understand why that word is 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 interesting because I think it goes back to what I talk about building that relationship, that trust, and yes. etc. And, and and so obviously that person feels like their firm is being overly compliant. And what I, I'm hopeful is that from a mindset standpoint, we can all find that right balance right between compliance and and what we're trying to do for the customer and i know i have an example of one of the call centers that i worked with where you know they were trying to be concerned about you know lost productivity in terms of people taking too long of breaks etc so at some point they installed you know the biometrics so you had to put thumbprint to come in you know etc etc but but Ultimately, they still got sued on a wage theft uh, case, right? Even with that kind of tool. And so ultimately, they had to do workforce management using a different kind of software package that allowed people to be able to be paid when they have to fire up and do all the applications, all the stuff that happens be uh-huh. before the call. But my point of even bringing that up is then learned that that workforce management software also became a productivity. It allowed you to better balance your load so that you have better service to customers. And I always say, sir, you serve to sell. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're not serving, to me, you're not selling, okay. not, not, not at least in the right way. Great. And so now all of a sudden, you know, in inbound, we know the most important thing in inbound is to answer the so you have a better balance of, of being able to do that. So then they were also able to use it to start to see on the outbound part of their business when's the right time to call, the right industry to call. It started teaching them so much more. So I just think even if it feels like, and I'm not saying that this person isn't being over compliant in terms of how it's being perceived. The question is, how do we build a relationship so that we see both the compliance piece of it and the opportunity piece to better serve our customers and therefore generate better revenue for the business. Andy, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's funny. Because, uh, you know, from a compliance perspective, yeah, I think to some of us, uh, it it can seem like it is overbearing, right? I mean, I've been lucky to serve in a lot of different roles, strategy and analytics. Uh, and, and in operations too. And when I was in operations, I did feel like compliance was the business prevention unit. Um, and, and it really came to a point after I took over compliance. And what's funny is strategy and analytics and compliance run parallel lines, right? You want to be, you want to have the best strategy for the best customer at the right time with the left you know, friction points. Uh, and anytime you add a friction point, which sometimes the operation seems like it's it's more restrictive uh, or, or overly compliant and them not understanding 
or not having the the background behind behind it, yeah, it, it will feel like you know you're you're really being handcuffed, right? Uh, and that's not always the case. Uh, but but to have that that understanding, and this is a, a big part of the people aspect of it. Like I was talking earlier, the culture is one thing. But training and, and learning and development is huge, too. And, and I really encourage everybody in our sales organization and, and operations, especially, too, to, to make sure they understand the regulation. And for them to be SMEs, as my team is SMEs, uh, and have that, that understanding of, hey, we're not trying to handcuff you. We're, we're trying to enable you and empower you to do more, to be able to do it in a compliant manner for you to come back and say, hey, look, does this sound right to you? Or I, I hear that this new regulation in, in New York is coming out. What what's, are the impacts to that? And, that, and that's that two-way street. Uh, and and you know, some of that perception of being overly restrictive or, or overly compliant, you know, will go away. I think to some extent it's always going to exist. Um, but I, I think we can really protect ourselves better by better education, making sure they understand the regulations and how they impact their business uh, and how to be compliant. And then having that, that, that consistent conversation on it as well, because, you know, I, I challenge everybody if, if, if in this group, in my company, if, if you can find something that we're not doing that we should be doing from a compliance perspective, then I should be the first person that you tell. Uh, and, the, and then the opposite end of that, if you feel like we're doing something too restrictive, you should challenge me on it and make sure we can ground and account for your concerns. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to have that trust. You're not going to be able to build that relationship and, and making sure they understand that the requirement and how and why we are compliant and how we are compliant makes a big difference. Well, I think some of some of the time, some of it is also just the time it takes when you're dealing with disclosures or disclaimers that have to be read. So if you have the ability to automate those, um, I know from a salesperson's perspective, you're, that's taking time out from your call to get to your next sales opportunity, right? So if you have the ability to automate some of those those aspects, whether that be through an IV or smart IVR or through some kind of a portal where that customer is opting in or opting out or acknowledging receipt or understanding, that I think takes takes it off of the salesperson as well. So I just, I strongly encourage everyone to look at what other pieces that might be self-service type ways that you can free up that salesperson a little bit more if you're feeling overly worked in that aspect. I, so. I think that's a great point, Laura. That's as, 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 as we continue talking about it, I was taken in the way, way back machine to my car that had a cassette deck in it when I was on the phones. And I was thinking about all the disclosures that I had to read at the end of a magazine sale or at the end of any sort of sale. And I was thinking about how those disclosures have only gotten so much more intense in the last more than 20 years. Um, I won't say exactly how long, but those those disclosures as a salesperson, they, yeah, sure, they could be a real drag on, on your productivity, but I think your point is also great. great. Automate some things where you possibly can. Get people to opt in where you can. And, and I guess... To me, the perspective of overly compliant means, and, and to me, um, we, we have an opportunity to work together with compliance to figure out how to say what we need to say and still get it done. There's no right way to do it the wrong way, I guess. Right. So let's see, the next question is going to go to... Harvey, we're going to throw this to you. <clears throat> How, um, what are any pending upcoming regulatory changes 
that we see at the federal or state level. Well, I don't know how any of us can really answer that one particularly. But yeah, that's yeah. I, I think you might have asked that because I'm from California, so you probably figure our state would lead the way with more regulations, right? <laughs> Let's see more privacy. More, I, I do know that we see the California Privacy Initiative being picked up by other states, and all these states watch what everybody else does. And so when when the CPI came out, we were all worried about what is this going to impact here, and how is this how is this going to change our business? But now I'm not I'm not so worried about the CPI. I'm worried about the year. Arizona Privacy Initiative and the Wisconsin Privacy Initiative, and it's not that there are initiatives in those states. We worry about the opportunity that there will be those. Yeah, and I, I'm going to answer that question very simply from my perspective, because again, I'm a sales guy, but again, that means you're a service guy, and you have to be a compliance guy. But at the end of the day, that's one of the reasons I come to the summit <laughs> to get that in, that. Qu- question answered because I think as Michelle and some of the other panelists, et cetera, I always can answer that question better after my time spent at PACE events than I can prior to PACE events. Um, So I I would just, I'm going to kind of leave my comments at that in terms of, that's why I'm not just a panelist, but but I'm going to be a participant throughout the day um, and throughout the the, the entire summit because this is is where you get to hear what regulators are thinking at. And I think we all know the one thing I will, I made a joke about my beloved home state, but we all know we need to have common guidelines because this state to state stuff um, is just, uh, it is very tough to implement when you're running nationwide programs, et cetera. So uh, I think as we continue to learn, we all have to help give, we all have to help work with our legislators and uh, both locally and, and federally to try to give us a playing field that gives us an ability to do what we need to do while serving the customer that they're trying to protect as well. Right. And I think that was the best answer you could have possibly had, Harvey. That was really fantastic. Uh, let's go back to the, to the questions and answers here. Um, Laura, this will be for you. The Omni Channel is so critical, as everyone is pointing out. Is there an effective method from either a compliance or sales standpoint, or even CX perspective, in terms of contact via phone first or email, or is it really individualized? I think it's really individualized. Um, it across a different products across the different across the different states it's very individualized uh, from from my perspective J- Andy do you have additional you want to add into on that yeah I, I think you're right um, and one of the things too kind of go back to the last question so I'll, I'll kind of answer them both at the same time because they're really directly related in my opinion and this is something, and, and Harvey, you know, is, is one of the PACE directors as well that, that we've been doing for the last couple of years in terms of advocacy is, is really meeting with the regulators, meeting with the FCC, meeting with, you know, other regulators in the space uh, to make sure, you know, we are aware of what's coming down the road from a regulatory perspective, advocating and informing and educating them of how we are self-compliant and how we govern ourselves and what that looks like. Um, because if you really think of it from a consumer perspective, you know, the regulators view us as big business, right? They, they think that, you know, there, there's certain just, you know, preconceived perceptions of us. And when we meet with the regulators and, you know, Pace has been really great about this and really passionate about making sure they understand Understand that we care for our clients, sure, and they are, you know, Fortune 500 companies, but 
they represent a large part of the consumer base in the United States and, and even internationally. We haven't even talked about international stuff here, but you know, we can because it's an impact to it as well. But you know, we want to make sure that the, the regulators understand that we are, you know, viewing the consumer as the ultimate customer. The end point should be where that decision is made to answer the call. What call or, or how we should contact them, when we should call them. Uh, so if you go back to regulations and things of that nature, yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to see a lot of stuff that gives back the, the ownership and the control to the consumer, uh, whether it's data privacy laws in California from the good state state of California where, where Harvey's at or the good state of Virginia where my our governor just signed one in that goes into effect in, in 2023. Um, and, and yeah, so that's going to be an impact of the consumer of, of controlling that. And I think, you know, if, if I whiteboard my, you know, best case scenario, an optimal you know, situation, yeah, yeah, from a consumer perspective, we would tr strive to understand what their desires, what their preferences are, so we can manage consent, we get consent at that point, but also the, the channel of, of communication that they prefer and when they prefer to be contacted. Yeah. Uh, and that's where omni-channel and, and automation and efficiency really come into play. Uh, I mean, we can avoid calls, we can avoid chats or whatever the case is, if we can you know, tailor that strategy strategy to a consumer level based on the preferences because it, it's going to be less of a frictionless environment for them. They're more apt and, and responsive to those types of communications. It's, it's what they want anyway, and we're just obeying and, and being, uh, you know, you know in, in alignment with what they've already expressed to us, you know, capturing that information. And, and I think, you know, a lot of the regulations going back to that for a second, will we'll point us in that direction. I think we've already seen it with data privacy with more control with, with what we use in terms of data, protecting that data, make sure it's encrypted. And, and you know, we meet all the requirements from that perspective because, I mean, right now, from a consumer's perspective, everything is, is very confusing and, and, and they're not in control in a lot of different areas. Um, I mean, you think of call labeling and blocking and stir shaking and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they get bombarded. And just now I got bombarded with a, a, a caller ID that showed up as Virginia, but it had Minnesota also. So how does a call originate from Minnesota and Virginia? So there's just lack of consumer trust with us right now as well. Uh, and so managing that preference, managing you know, their consent uh, and building the, the process that's best for them. Um, and ultimately, I think that's where we're going to be. And, and I, I think we'll, st we'll continue to see, you know, regulation to that extent as well, not only in data privacy, but, but other things too. Uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, go through everything because like, like Harvey mentioned, I mean, you know, that's a lot of the reason why we come conferences, but, you know, since I manage compliance, you know, I, I can steal a little bit of Michelle and Reed's thunder from the, uh, the the compliance officers forum that's going to be later today or tomorrow, uh, where we will go into more depth about this stuff. But, um, you yeah, th know, there's going to be a lot of stuff, not only from a, a TCPA perspective with the Facebook decision, like she mentioned earlier, but, but a lot of, of stuff uh, at the state level for sure, uh, you know, not only from a data privacy perspective, but just, just a, a lot of other things, uh, a lot of state TCPA-like requirements. Um, I know there's a couple of bills out there now, uh, and again, I'm not going to try to still have all this under, but, you know, in Florida, for example, where, you know, the, the, the governor there is looking to have a bill that's more uh, relaxed. 
and, and what can be used and what equipment can be used to make these types of sales calls or, or calls in general. Uh, and then the flip side of that is you'll have more restrictive governors in other states who want to put their, you know, state on things and be more restrictive than what the, the you know the Facebook decision to find an auto dollar as and so you, you'll still continue to see those nuances but but again you know we, we want to make sure that you know at the end of the day it's a compliant manner we're respecting the consumer's wishes their requirements their consent their preferences I, I think you know preferences don't get talked about enough. Um, and then again, kind of like that informed decision from a business perspective I was talking about earlier, we want the consumer to, at the end of the day, have the, the most, the optimal you know, strategy to make contact with them or to reach out back to us. I mean, inbound is a big part of this as well, you know, at their leisure, when it's, when it's convenient for them, when it's painless for them. Them, eliminate as many points of failure as we can, as many touch points as we can. Uh, so it's so it's seamless, efficient, and it's something they'll tell their neighbors and, and others about, um, you know, as a service and as a promoter. Yeah. One of the technologies we've started using more recently was just the SMS texting. Um, we decided to use that for our retention portion of our line of our business. Business, where you have the ability to send that quick text out to literally thousands of individuals. Um, the technology allows it to go out as to thousands at one time, but obviously they're receiving it as one and only when they're responding back, they're only responding back to you. Um, that type of technology, again, has allowed us to be able to touch many Many people who, and, and like I said, in, in the retention piece of it, that's that's huge for us. The sales piece of it, if you can sell it, but you lose it because you because the retention, that's that's still your issue, right? You still got to keep you got to keep the business on. But we've lost people in the past for things simple as their credit card had expired or they had changed it because there was a data breach somewhere and the, the number has changed. Um, um, so utilizing the technology as far as SMS and having maybe an email address within the app that they can respond to uh, so that you have uh, the ex extended period of time to be able to reach back out to them um, versus that incoming, the inbound phone call that's coming in that you go to answer within your 30 seconds or 60 seconds or whatever that metrics is that you're trying to deal with. You can you can spread it out throughout your day a little bit better, but the the omni channel, the chat sessions, the email sessions, the SMS, um, same thing. That's huge technology for for, for this this new era that we're in. Um, I would strongly suggest that if you if if you don't have it, you're not utilizing it in your business. Um, something you definitely want to look in. To um, makes a huge difference for you. Laura, I think that's a really great point. And I think we saw a lot of changes at the beginning of the pandemic where people started using different communication channels simply out of need, a requirement. We, we, we have to communicate with these people. There are not enough people to do it. So what are we going to do? And so we saw a lot more email adoption and we saw a lot more uh, text message usage and going back to the question from the from the the, the audience which was you know, is there is it individual preference it's individual preference and analytics will show you pretty quickly what the overall individual preference is it sort of establishes your roadmap really really quickly trick is to make sure that you're compliant in administering every single one of those channels so that you have the right user experience because one mistake 
and the way that whole communication chain is set up. For example, Laura, sending the thousands of text messages. I remember a few years ago, we had a client who lost the ability to send text messages because of one mistake yeah. in their text messaging. And you just have to get that stuff set up. Uh, an old mentor of mine said, you never get a second chance to set it up right the first time. Exactly. That's really, that's really what it comes down to, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the other thing too. Go ahead, Laura. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Now, the other thing I was going to say quickly is just, you know, we talk about omni-channel and sometimes that's a, a vague term or it means different things to different people. I mean, true omni-channel really should be that, that cross-sectional strategy or interrelated strategy between contact channels. So if they, you know, express consumer, cons you, know, uh, you know, preference or consent or just a request on the website, they can go to chat. They can go to tags. They can opt in. And when you gain that, then a lot of that risk goes away, right? Because yeah. they're opting in and they're choosing that, that omni-channel strategy or that, that other method a channel but you know some people you know just define omni-channel as multi-channel where it's text only or, or it's only voice uh, and those two channels don't you know connect you know strategically and that's that's the wrong thing not only from a compliance perspective but also from a, a consumer perspective as well and, and that's the thing it's just critical that the tree omni-channel is interrelated across those channels Great point. Harvey, anything to add? Well, I mean, I think Andy and, and Laura's comments were spot on. You know, it's funny. When I think about omni-channel, it, it, the integration part that Andy talked about is really the critical component because, you know, lots of companies have all those different channels, but we know they're siloed. And so when you move from one to other, there is no integration. So, therefore, it's not seamless. And I think, Andy, it might have been you. Somebody talked about frictionless earlier. And we know if you were setting up a brand new company today, you try to design customer service to almost be whether you call it contactless or self-service, however you want to define that. But you're trying to make it work so that everything's intuitive. You know, it's kind of like I tell people, if you pick up a smartphone, as complex as those things are, you know, meaning more computing power than the, 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 the computers that put the uh, people in, 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 in orbit and on the moon. The reality is most people, it's very intuitive. You know how to work it right away. Um, and so I think our service policies uh, and service needs to be the same way. It needs to be intuitive and seamless as I move from retail to chat to call center, inbound, outbound. Um, that's where we're all trying to get. Right. That's fantastic. Well, we've got just a few minutes left. And if there's anybody out there in the audience who'd like a, who has a question that they would like to submit, we, this would probably be a great time. But, but as we're waiting for that question, let me just say thank you to everybody for participating in this. Um, it's great to talk to you all. It's great to see all of you since I haven't seen most of you for i don't know 15 or 16 months at least so this is fantastic thank you very much for participating in this um laura any any last thoughts on compliance and and and, and working with operations just make compliance is your best friend that's that's <laughs> my that's my that's how i would put it compliance is your best friend and when you have a a uh, team that can work together, um, there's nothing you can't achieve. So work hand in hand with your compliance team. I feel like that deserved a double thumbs up from Andy for sure. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Uh, we, we did get a last question. 
question here. Is there any recommended, is there recommended approaches for having quality data and or processes to remain compliant? Harvey, you want to take this? Are there any recommended approaches for having quality data and or processes to remain compliant? Well, I mean, I think I'm going to pick up. I'm oh, sorry about that. I'm going to pick up with what Laura talked about. I, I think you have to look at some of the latest technologies out there, and there's a lot of folks who are participating in this summit and who uh, support the organization that can help you uh, from a technology standpoint. I just think at the end of the day, that's where you get the scale and the scope um, to be able to leverage. Uh, compliance, uh, both in a productivity way, but more importantly, it protects you because when, when you use the technology properly, you can see when people are out of compliance, when that person, that person either out of good intentions trying to serve steps out of compliance or, or whether you have a creative person whose intentions aren't quite so pure. So partly I, I would just say, I, I think there's a lot of wonderful technology that's available to us, and, and we have to try to explore that, and in order to explore it and really make it, because everybody's concerned about profitability right now, now you're going to have to look at it, not just from a compliance lens, but from a revenue lens, and if you do, do those two things together, I think you see it as opportunity and not as, you know, handcuffs. Outstanding. That was great, Harvey. Anything to add, Andy? No, I, I think that's good. Uh, yeah, I, I think from a from a quality perspective, and just having you know metrics in place, key performance indicators. Of course, everybody knows that term, but there's also key you know performance indicators from a compliance perspective as well, and making sure you have measurable data results and actionable data. I mean, that's the critical piece of it, right? I mean, you know, anybody can have reporting, but if it's not actionable and, and something that's readily available and that's meaningful, then it doesn't do operations or even compliance any good, right? It's the same way around policies. I, you know, even though I make everybody document, you know, policies to the T because that's what we're required to do, There's a reason why we do that and making sure they understand that. Uh, but, but if a policy is not put into place and it's not you know, done correctly and it's not actionable, then it's, it's, it's worthless, right? The same thing with reporting. Uh, it's, it, it has to be meaningful. It has to be looking at the right thing uh, and making sure that you do have everything accounted for from a reporting perspective. And then you can track and, and measure, you know, value appropriately. Uh, and like Harvey said, I mean, there's a lot of different technology uh, out there um, that, that can help you with that, to create those types of dashboards for the meaningful compliance metrics. And, uh, you, know, you know, ultimately that will make it a lot more actionable and meaningful for everybody. Can I just say this too? And Jay, I apologize. Just one other thing too. Because I know I've talked about technology and it's really critical, and we all have. But I also want to just talk about culture real quickly. Because at the end of the day, your culture of your company and how you set that culture up and re reinforce it with your behavior as a leader um, really will set the foundation for not just your sales, but compliance and everything. So I just want to make one quick plug that you really need to analyze your company culture and your part in that culture and make sure it's it's the culture that you want um, um, and so that your brand of your company as well as you as an individual is the brand that you want to uh, uh, display and, and for people to receive. Gosh, that was well said, Harvey. That was very well said. I, I, it's funny because I think 
I, when I think of compliance and sales, I think of it as a big sandwich with layers. I've got to get data on everything, and then I've got to have different systems to check that data. But it really does come down to culture because if we don't have the right culture in place that wants to enact that, wants to enable that compliance lens, it's just not going to happen. This has really been fun, and I think we just went a minute over. Thank you so much, and sorry that you weren't able to participate, Krista. <laughs> thank you, Jay, for picking up the mantle. Yeah, thank you, Jay. <laughs> Glad I can help. Glad I can help. We'll we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank everybody. you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye.